Would you please stand for the presentation of colors? On behalf of the Rockwell Elementary, I'd like to welcome you to our Veterans Day program. Our theme this year at Rockwell Elementary is inspired by Dr. Seuss. All the things you will learn at Rockwell Elementary. Many of you may not know that Theodore Geisel, also known as Dr. Seuss, was a member of the U.S. Army. Before he became famous as a children's author, Dr. Seuss worked as a political cartoonist. Dr. Seuss led a two-front war of his own as a cartoonist against isolationists, racism, and urging the United States to help the British in World War II. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, Dr. Seuss's cartoons focused on building American support to win the war. During World War II, he accepted a commission in the U.S. Army and created the private snap food training films for soldiers. Dr. Seuss says it best when we think of our veterans. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. We are very proud at Rock Valley Elementary to educate our students about Veterans Day. Men and women who risk their lives for people they never knew. Men and women who risk their lives for the great USA. We are proud to teach our students here that heroes don't wear capes. Heroes wear dog tags. Will our veterans at this time please stand to be recognized? Thank you very much for your service to the great United States of America. This Veterans Day, we honor and say thank you to all of you. Soldiers young, soldiers old, who fought for freedom, freedom brave and bold. For those who lived while others have died, you fill us full of pride. Every year, our humble words on Veterans Day 
can never do justice to the sacrifice made by all of you, our veterans. So to all of you, to the fallen, and to your families, there's no tribute, no commemoration, no praise that can truly match the magnitude of your service and your sacrifice. On behalf of our community, on behalf of this great country, we say thank you and God bless you. At this time, I would like to invite kindergarten students Charlie and Eli Young, fourth grade students Casey Young, and their parents Dwight and Christy Young to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Lieutenant Colonel Dwight Young is a Rock Valley <coughs> graduate and recently retired after 20 years of service as a Harrier pilot in the United States Marine Corps. Will you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Saints, Soldiers, and Spies, 
women, and more. This morning, Pippa will be sharing just a shorter version of her full program. We strongly encourage and hope that many of you will join us this afternoon for her full performance from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. in the high school auditorium. The parking will be available up front and we'll have people to assist you to park in the bus lane. But we would encourage you to come back today at 1.30 for Pippa's full performance. At this time, it'll take us just a few minutes to set up. Let's please give a warm welcome to Pippa White. Oh, 
said the bridge is gone. Oh, how can we cross this river so long? If we can't cross the river, there will be great loss. Do you know of another bridge where we may cross? Yes, said Emma, but it's a bridge unsafe. But I can help you. I know a place. I know a place where the water is low. You can walk across it. I'll get my horse and we'll go. No, said the general. We haven't time to saddle a horse, so you must climb upon my steed and ride with me. We'll ride like the wind. Together, you'll see. Off they went, lickety split, across a field, a ravine, a pit. But Emma was sharp. Emma was keen. She said, General, get down, or soon we'll be seen. So they left the horse, and they struggled through brush. The guns were firing. They had to dodge and rush. But there, cried Emma, there is the place where your men may cross, and your men will be safe. He asked for her name and a lock of hair. But the cannons were firing, and she did not dare to stay where she was, so she made her way back to her home, and there she did stay. The general wrote her a letter. She treasured it dear. He said, you say it today, and that is really good. She never saw him again, but she did not fret. And that wartime ride, she would never forget. Few people know about Emma's ride. Few people know she was a general's guide. Few people know about Emma so brave. And that because of little Emma, many lives were saved. Old maid. Perhaps 
so obvious, they never had a clue that one of the Union's greatest spies was Elizabeth Van Loo. I devised a brilliant system, a system of ciphers and codes with invisible ink, no less, to travel Confederate roads. I put that coded message in the hollow heel of a shoe of a trusty former slave who once belonged to the house of Van Loo. When that message was retrieved, milk and acid were applied, and invisible ink was visible to eager Union eyes. I was the Richmond operative, Crazy Lizzie, Crazy Liz, Crazy Beth, silly old maid in the mansion, to whom the Union is a little in debt. I warned generals of impending attacks, the where, the when, and the how. To President Lincoln, I was an invaluable agent. To Richmond, a silly old cow. So I disused all that gossip. I let my hair go untidy, uncouth, and I'd mumble as I walked down the street. No one suspected the truth. When 100 Union men broke free of a Confederate jail, I housed every last one of them. The Confederates were not on my trail. Oh, I was watched by police and detectives, and my house searched many a time. But they never could find anything wrong. They never convict Liz of a crime, even though my house had a big secret room where many a Yankee did hide. Like the ciphers, they never could find it, no matter how much they searched and they tried. Something else that might surprise you, something else that no one knew. My great big beautiful mansion was a house on the underground railroad, too. When the war was over, Ulysses S. Grant came by to personally thank Crazy Lizzie, the Union's most unusual spy. I lived the rest of my life in Richmond, shunned by my neighbors alone. A few days after I died, a mob gathered and burned down my lovely old home. She died in September 1900 with an epitaph richly deserved. She risked everything, friends, fortune, life that the union might be preserved. and try 
want to steal what little food we had, that we had to bathe in a creek, that we would always be hungry, always frightened, that we would grab shovels and dig foxholes so that we had something to climb into when the Japanese bombers came, that we would all have diarrhea, dysentery, malaria. Yeah, it was actually a very good thing that none of us knew what we were getting ourselves into. From the moment of the first bombing, I lost my appetite. I lost 30 pounds on the time. But the Army let us bring lipstick and powder and toothbrushes, so we always kept ourselves neat and clean in appearance. And those soldiers thought we were the most beautiful women in the world. They housed us in huts called Basha. They had palm frond leaves as roofs and curtains as doors. Inside there would be two to four army cots. That was the extent of the furniture. One night, after a long hard day, I fell into bed and fell fast asleep. But I was awakened suddenly by something with warm breath pushing against the mosquito netting around my bed. Then I heard the low, throaty rumble of an animal coming at me from the same place as the warm breath directly into my face. It continued to push the mosquito netting up and down that side of my body, as if sniffing, smelling. I lay paralyzed with fear, because I had quickly decided that the animal was a tiger. Oh, I had heard of the men working on the Lido Road being attacked by tigers, mauled, and sent to the hospital. My heart was pounding so violently, I thought my chest would rupture. I wanted to call out to Fitzy, the nurse on the other side of the bamboo partition. But my mouth was as dry as a bone. The terror had turned my tongue to concrete. I was this animal's prisoner, who was sometimes so close to me, I could feel its fur. I visualized it sinking its sharp teeth into me, pulling me off the cot, taking me into the jungle, no one knowing what had happened to me. This went on for hours. The animal prowling the area around my bed. Finally, it jumped up onto a shelf where I kept some clothing. When the first light of dawn came through the palm frond roof, I could see that the animal was not a tiger. It was a smaller jet black animal with wide-set, yellow, narrow eyes. As more light of dawn came through that roof, the animal jumped down, walked through the curtains, and I began to cry. 
Yeah, but you know what? I bet anyone, even some of the big, strong soldier men in, the, in this room, would be scared to have a, a tiger or, or a panther prowling around their bed in the middle of the night. Yes, ma'am. What, honey? How old was Emma? Some say 15, some say 16. Okay? So pretty young. Yes, sir. How did the girls become Army? You mean now or back then? Back then, in the Civil War, they had to disguise themselves. And there were many of them. And, and there's one who wrote an autobiography. She wrote about her life. Her name was Sarah Emma Edmonds. And she called herself Frank Thompson. And she dressed up like a man and carried a gun and got all through the war without, uh, without being wounded. So uh, a lot of women can do that. OK, I don't want to take time here. In the sparkly shirt, How did Emma know where the shallow place was? Because she lived there. And you see, armies were always on the march. And armies were coming into unfamiliar places. So they needed to ask people from the community for help. And so because she had grown up there in the same place, in the same way as if he, if he was grown up, you, you know things about Rock Valley that I don't know. Because you live here and I don't. And that's why Emma knew. So my friends, uh, Mr. Orkman, who are we? Are we OK time-wise? OK, one more question. One more question. Yes, sir. Why did they just have curtains? Is that what your question is? Because it was tropical. And in tropical places, it's really hot, even at night. And so I guess they felt that that was going to be enough. They didn't expect that a panther would want to pay a visit. But that's a good question. You guys, this shows that you were very good listeners this morning. And I really appreciate that. I'm delighted to be in your community. Thank you all. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pepe. And whoosh. Never know what these little kids are going to ask. So, <laughs> your moms and dads and grandmas and grandmas, I know you can understand that. So, no, thank you very much, Pippa, and we hope that many of you will be able to come back this afternoon. The program will start at 1.30 sharp in the high school auditorium, and it's a 90-minute performance that she will be doing. So we hope that many of you will join us. We'd also like to thank all of you for joining us today. At this time, we are going to have our K-5 students um, we'll start the song, God Bless America, and then halfway through the song, Mrs. Boltice will turn around and ask all of you to um, join in with us. After the singing of God Bless America, will you please stay standing for the retirement of our flag, which will conclude our program today, and we hope that many of our veterans and spouses will be joining us for lunch. God bless you, and thank you for coming. Will you please stand for God Bless America.
coming. Happy Veterans Day, everyone.